in the fight. Glimmers of hope. New York State seeing their number of ICU patients falling. We are cautiously optimistic. But while the curve may be flattening, other states are bracing for their surges. President Trump's focus, reopening the country. But when? It's the biggest decision I'll ever make. The concerns for a second wave, plus when those relief checks will get here. New testing sites targeting minority communities. The alarming statistics showing the impact of this virus. I've been carrying around an inhaler in my pocket for 40 years out of fear of having a fatal asthma attack. Plus why the Surgeon General is sharing his own story this morning. Teaming up, tech giants Google and Apple putting competition aside, working to create a coronavirus tracking system. The potential benefits even as it raises privacy concerns. Easter from a distance. The dramatic differences this weekend. Bye, bye. The switch in services, but finding a way to worship together. Still, other churches remaining defiant. The court decision expected today. And above and beyond, staff members at two assisted living facilities choosing to isolate with their residents. I could not ask for better staff. Their 24-7 commitment and why they didn't think twice. Live from ABC News in New York, this is Good Morning America. Good morning. Happy Saturday. Millions of people around the world this morning are spending the holiday weekend social distancing. Dan and I are here in the studio while Wit is at home. Good morning to you, Wit. Eva and Dan, good morning to you both. Still adjusting to this new normal, but as you mentioned, working from home once again, like so many other Americans out there, doing our part to keep people safe. But we have a lot to cover this morning on the pandemic, including some promising signs in certain parts of the country, but the numbers are still staggering. Indeed they are, my friend. Good morning to you. Here in the U.S., there are more than 500,000 cases with more than 18,000 deaths. But nearly 30,000 Americans have recovered. In New York, there are signs of hope despite a rising death toll in the hot zone. The state's infection rate is slowing and fewer people are being admitted to the ICU. Now, with health officials saying key indicators show the U.S. may be leveling off, President Trump plans to announce an opening our country council next week. Health officials are urging people, though, for now to stay the course. We have team coverage from New York to Washington. We begin with Stephanie Ramos in Brooklyn. Good morning to you, Stephanie. Eva, good morning. New York's governor, Andrew Cuomo, says that daily intensive care unit admissions are going down, possibly a sign that stay-at-home orders are having an effect and the worst may have passed. But he is stressing that the state is losing lives quickly. All of this while other states still haven't hit their peak. This morning, with more than half a million coronavirus cases in the U.S. and growing, New York State may be seeing results after weeks of social distancing and stay-at-home orders. The number of ICU patients falling for the first time since the pandemic began, an encouraging sign. We are cautiously optimistic that we are slowing the infection rate. Now, with evidence of a flattening curve in some states, President Trump is looking to create a task force focused on reopening the country. It's the biggest decision I'll ever make. Trump saying he'll announce how to move forward early next week. Say, sir, what metrics you will use to make that decision? Uh, the metrics right here. That's my metric. But according to a New York Times report, new federal projections warn of a spike in coronavirus infections if shelter-in-place orders were lifted after only 30 days, a second wave likely spiking midsummer. I would hope that by November we would have things under such control that we could have a real degree of normality. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo emphasizing the key to reopening America's hardest-hit state will be testing. It's not enough if you want to reopen on a meaningful scale and reopen quickly. We need uh, an unprecedented mobilization where government can produce these tests in the millions. Tests like the ones rolling out in Northern California, an antibody study to determine whether people have been exposed without knowing it. These people lining up Friday, waiting to learn their immunity status. This, as so many cities across the country prepare for a surge in patients. 
U.S. Marines flying into Boston to support authorities and the Massachusetts National Guard. Boston's first field hospital taking its first patients as the city braces for its peak in cases in the next 10 days. We are about to have a very difficult couple of weeks here in Massachusetts. The governor of Maryland, Larry Logan, also warning of tough days ahead. We are ramping up the curve. This is going to be one of our most dangerous times ever this weekend and over the next week or so. And there are more cities adding field hospitals, anticipating a need for beds. This morning in Detroit, a new field hospital as the governor bans residents from driving to each other's homes statewide. With life on hold for millions of Americans, the financial impact increasingly apparent. Long lines at food banks in Pittsburgh and Los Angeles. We are looking for another fresh food. I hope it will help for our family. A seemingly never-ending stretch of cars lined up hours before food banks even open. It's really tough to see um, because these are people with families and they don't know where the next meal is going to come from. But relief is on the way for some Americans. The government saying stimulus checks will be direct deposited as early as Wednesday. And amid the desperation, recovery. In the U.S., nearly 30,000 people have recovered from the virus. 44-year-old Tracy Sengel is one of them. Here she is getting a massive send-off from this South Austin Medical Center after 10 days on a ventilator. And she spoke exclusively with GMA. Oh, that was awesome. Made me feel very special. I didn't think it was that big of a deal, but um, yeah, they showed me it was. And there are similar cases around the country. Here in Brooklyn, a heart surgeon returned to work this week to this medical center after recovering from the virus. Eva. Some stories of hope. Thank you, Stephanie. And joining us now from Massachusetts is Dr. Todd Ellery, an ABC News medical contributor and infectious diseases physician. And from Washington, Tom Bosser, an ABC News contributor and former White House Homeland Security Advisor. Tom, let's start with you. The numbers, at least in New York, seem to be improving. The president and many others are really keen to reopen the economy. Is that even something we should be talking about yet? No, good morning, Eva. Uh, he needs to talk about it. In fact, I'd like him to talk more about it, but he has to do it in a really careful way. And so what we're pointing out is everybody in the country is on a different part of the roller coaster, some on their way up with this curve and some on their way down. And what he's going to have to do is come out with a really thoughtful strategy, not just fire the gun one day and let all the horses all come back out and, and race at the same time. So everybody's looking to get out of their homes, but what we'll have to do is impose some different levels of patience across the country, and that's really going to require some plan for distributing these scarce tests that we need so bad. And Dr. Ellerin, the WHO is out with a report of some patients in South Korea testing positive again for the virus after initially testing negative. How big of a concern could this be? Oh, good morning, Eva. So I think that, remember, these are very sensitive tests, okay? So you can vacillate sometimes between negative and positive. What's more important, I think, is to make sure these patients don't have symptoms. If you don't have symptoms but have a positive test, it may be that you have dead virus that's still being picked up but you can't transmit. So, you know, more to come about that. And speaking of those tests, how critical is it to have more testing? Well, I think testing is critical, but I think to open the country, four things need to happen. And we probably want to think of it more on a state level, like Tom said. You need to have, first of all, sustained decrease in new cases and death rates. You want to make sure hospitals have ample capacity. Testing is critically important, and we have to be able to monitor new cases as well as contact trace. Uh, good information there. And finally, Tom, should masks be required when the stay-at-home order is lifted? Yeah, Eva, absolutely. In fact, if we don't do that, we're going to look back on this entire response and think, man, we really missed an opportunity there. The data is coming in from around the country, from around the world. The Czech Republic had the best outcome of all the Eastern European countries. And really, the only thing they did differently there was not only wear masks across their whole population, but they made it kind of cool. People were wearing, wearing masks, making them. It was something that you did, and if you didn't do it, you were socially shunned. And they reduced the spread. Remember, all the mask does is it keeps those of us that are sick and don't know it 
from making everyone else sick. And that's really the trick here. We don't need high-end tests all the time for everything. We've got a scarcity of them. So when you don't have enough tests to identify all the problems, put a mask on every one of those viral landmines, every one of us that could infect others, and you kind of diffuse that landmine and you can kill and suppress this virus. All right, Tom Bosser and Dr. Todd Ellerin, thank you both for joining us this morning. The mask wearing a real shift for our culture. Wit, let's send it to you. All right, Eva, thank you. Several states are now focusing on black and Latino communities, which continue to be hard hit by coronavirus. Louisiana's governor has formed a health equality task force, and New York is opening a handful of new testing sites to study and address the problem. ABC's Zachary Keese joins us from one of those new locations in Brooklyn with a look at this growing concern. Zachary, good morning. Good, good morning to you as well. In many ways, it's the story inside the story. Everybody's been impacted by coronavirus, but in some areas, the numbers show that black and Latinos have been hit disproportionately hard uh, in, in really showing the inequities that exist inside the healthcare system. I'm outside of a new testing facility here in Brooklyn. Uh, it is the kind of place that officials now say more can and should be done. With cases in New York topping every country around the globe, new testing sites are now opening up across the city this morning. The new sites are focusing on minority communities after state-released data reveals they are some of the most impacted by the virus. It's alarming, but it's not surprising that people of color have a greater burden of chronic health conditions. The statistics are alarming. In Michigan, 40% of deaths are in the black community, even though they only make up 14% of the population. In Chicago, 72% of deaths have been among black residents who make up less than 30% of the population. Louisiana is seeing similar numbers. And here in New York, minorities have been hit hard. Approximately 34% of deaths are in the Latino community, and roughly 28% are African Americans. There's no doubt uh, systemic racism in our society still, and there's systemic structural inequality in our health care system. Statistically, these communities have a higher rate of underlying health conditions. Diseases like diabetes, hypertension, obesity, and asthma are disproportionately afflicting the minority populations, particularly the African Americans. Which contribute to the horrifying death rates brought on by the virus. The Surgeon General Jerome Adams delivering this personal message. I've been carrying around an inhaler in my pocket for 40 years out of fear of having a fatal asthma attack. And I hope that showing you this inhaler shows little kids with asthma all across the country that they can grow up to be Surgeon General one day. Those pre-existing conditions, as mentioned, the asthma, the hypertension, the high blood pressure, combined with lack of testing has been extremely problematic for these communities. Eva, back to you. I'll take it from here, Zachary. Thank you. Extremely problematic is one way to put it, perhaps not even strong enough. Thank you again. Now we turn to the two tech titans launching a rare collaboration to help track coronavirus. ABC's Trevor Alt has more on what Apple and Google are working on together. This morning, two of the world's biggest tech giants, Apple and Google, say they're setting aside competition for the greater good. The pair are announcing a voluntary coronavirus tracking system designed to trace the spread of COVID-19 and even alert you if you've been exposed. And if you get close enough for a long enough period of time, Apple and Google can record that. And in the event that you are diagnosed positive with COVID-19, they can send out an alert to other phones that you are near for that certain period of time. The technology would use Bluetooth data to keep track of phones that have been close to each other. It'll first roll out in May as an app designed by public health agencies, but Apple and Google have plans to build the function directly into their phone's operating systems, meaning if you want to use it, you just have to turn it on. Because they're collaborating and because they have a duopoly on smartphones, over time they're going to be able to get this technology to almost every smartphone user in America. That means potentially hundreds of millions of people could be participating in what's called contact tracing, which health officials say is one of the most promising ways to contain the virus. But the idea of tracking the movement of millions of people is raising concerns. Tech companies haven't always had a history of taking people's privacy seriously. 
So the devil will be in the details. Google's statement announcing the partnership said user privacy and security are central to the design and participation would be entirely voluntary. Jennifer Granick of the ACLU says Apple and Google seem to be taking steps to protect privacy in their design plans so far, but the companies will be under careful scrutiny. But in order for it to be helpful, people have to trust it. And that means it has to be private and it has to be voluntary. Our information can't go to the government or to a big company, and our choice to use it has to be entirely ours. And Apple and Google are going to be openly publishing their work so everyone can analyze it and make sure it's trustworthy. These companies are usually pretty bitter rivals. They say there has never been a more important time to work together. With Trevor Alt also reporting from home for us this morning. Thanks so much. Christians around the world are observing Holy Saturday this morning with the pandemic keeping many from gathering for services together. Musicians inside Paris's Notre Dame donned hazmat suits to take part in Good Friday observances nearly one year after the iconic cathedral was devastated by fire. Here in the U.S., churches are coming up with some unique alternatives for people who can't attend Easter Mass in person. ABC's David Wright has the story. It's a cruel irony of coronavirus that at the very moment we most need faith to comfort us, the virus has driven us into isolation. Churches, synagogues, and mosques are empty when they ought to be full. The streets of Jerusalem, holy to all three major religions, are empty because of a worldwide plague. But from virtual Passover seders on Zoom, to a solitary broadcast version of the Stations of the Cross at St. Peter's, the faithful are finding a way to worship together. Some communities are pointedly defying social distancing guidelines. In Kansas today, the state Supreme Court will hear arguments to determine whether congregations can gather with more than 10 people. With a shockingly irresponsible decision that will put every Kansas life at risk. But from Manila to Manhattan, the vast majority have found creative ways to get by. In Germany, drive-in theaters are making a comeback. Cathedrals of cars. Und die Schwester seiner Mutter. Just stay with him. One preacher printed out photos of all his parishioners to keep him company in the church. I spent one night, you know, in the chapel basically, uh, you know, masking tape and uh, printed photos, putting them all over the pews. And it was... For me, actually, it was an amazingly prayerful moment to be in a quiet chapel, kind of in the dark. And every time I put a picture up, I could, you know, remember the people who I was praying for and think about them. David Wright, ABC News, New York. Oh, thanks, David, for that. Mega Church Pastor Joel Osteen joins us live in GMA second hour to talk about some of the stars that are joining him. He's having a virtual Easter service this weekend. It's going to be a big moment for the culture. Time now to check the weather. Rob Marciano joining us from his home. And Rob, you're tracking a potential tornado outbreak this weekend? Yeah, that's right, Dan. Actually, a, a storm that's gathering that's going to have wide-reaching impacts, not just for the south where tornadoes are going to be a threat, but uh, northern states as well. We've already had some severe weather across parts of West Texas. This is kind of the precursor of the show here with one to two-inch hail diameter across uh, Upkin, Upkin County there. We also had a lot of uh, rain and cold weather across Southern California with records set there for record low maximums and daily rainfalls. That is ejecting into the plains and that's going to kind of combine with the northern system to bring snow to the north and severe weather to the south. T uh, later today and tonight, San Antonio, Austin, Waco. Those are the danger spots and then the, uh, the severe weather passes through Dallas and then I think Houston in the morning and then crossing uh, the Sabine over into Louisiana during the day tomorrow for uh, for Easter Sunday and that's where we think the severe weather threat is the greatest we'll tap up moisture from the Gulf we'll have strong low-level winds and strong tornadoes are possible anywhere from central Louisiana right through this entire state of Mississippi but Nashville Birmingham Atlanta all into the gun here and this pushes to the east on Monday with a strong wind field for just about everybody including the Northeast and that could be a headline with this system as well we'll have to be tracking them that's your check on the national headlines time now for a look at your local forecast Hello and good morning, Washington. Meteorologist Alex Liggett here. 62 degrees today. We'll be breezy at times as we head through the afternoon, around 10 to 15 miles per hour, so nothing like the past few days. Tomorrow, mostly cloudy skies for your Easter. Chance for a couple of showers. I think that best possibility is late. We are on weather alert for Monday. Could have that chance for a few added storms. Now, I'll tell you, added programming, we have a brand